What's up guys, my name is Khan, and we're back today with more Railroads Online. What's up, Heist? How's it going, sir? Wow, you looking great today. You're just looking, Well, you're, you're looking great yourself you as well. You shaved or You've, something, uh, maybe trimmed the beard a little bit there. It's, uh, uh, you know, try to trim it up, keep it flat to my face as physically yeah. possible, you know? Yeah, maybe it's just, just a texture or something. This looks like the Spider-Man meme. It's just... Uh... <laughs> Everyone's pointing at each other. It's All fun. right, so we got money. Uh, Khan, I, I've, I've, I, I've I ran heard. a couple trains. You've got money. You, we can actually buy an engine. We're gonna buy a class 48, um, is what you were saying? Yeah, I think that makes the most sense for the grade that we've got today because, I mean, we built that stupid grade out of, to, you know, getting to the iron mine. And I'm I mean, waiting 6. for 5 percent is ridiculous. Oh, and you, you did the math, right? You said it was like 104,000 yeah, pounds. Yeah, it should be good for about 104,000 pounds ish on that grade because it doesn't have a tender, and right. the less self-weight you can have, the better you're going to be, which is another reason why logging engines are so good, right? But, you know, with the Class 48, we'll be able to run speed. It's pretty cheap. Uh, it should give us the best bang for our buck right here in the early game. Okay. And so, later, it can be a shunter when we get, uh, you know, a little bit more money and, and powerful road engines. I'm, I'm looking at it. It looks like a large Betsy, which is basically what you were saying it is, which I understand. It's got the saddle saddle tank as well. So for people who don't know, this is the boil. I'm, you can't tell, but this center ring is the boiler, and the outside saddle piece is the actual water tank, which I think is super cool. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But important thing, <clears throat> how much does Heist know about engines? Yay, new segment. Uh -oh. All right, so uh -oh. who built the Class 48? What, what manufacturer? It's built by Baldwin. Okay, well, Baldwin Locomotive works, but I guess we'll accept just Baldwin. What's the model number of the Class 48? I don't know if you'll get this. Oh, God, the, the actual Baldwin yeah. number? Oh, God, uh, uh, I don't remember off the top 6-22-D is what it was. And 622-D, okay. What was the yeah. build date? The build date. What it year? depends on the railroad and when they bought them. I believe the Rio Grande got their first one in 1877. Wow, he gets it right. 1877. Holy cow. Unbelievable. Some points. They, they did get some later orders of the same class in 1881. So, you know. Anyway. All right. Um, <laughs> what do you want to name this? It's engine number two because obviously we have two number ones. So now we've got number two finally. Uh, what, do you want to, what do you want to name it? You got any? What do we... Well, I mean, we could we could just name it the goat because it's the yard goat. The yard know. goat, like the yard goat. That's, but like, that's isn't what they the were. goat the like were greatest of all time? Goat, like uh, that. That's uh, that is very you know twenty first century of us, and we're playing right. a game set in the nineteenth century. So <laughs> oh, it lets me put stuff on the tender, but there's nothing that I can actually. There is no tender. It's it is tenderless. Does writing anything on the tender do any? No, it doesn't. I was gonna put crap on the tender, but. All right, and then the only option we have for it is smokestacks, different spark arresters. They all cost extra money, so uh, we're just not, there's no reason for that. Um, there we go. The goat. Look at this thing. This thing looks amazing. Is it here? The goat, yes. Dude, it looks so chunky. Like, it is, it looks... It is, it is, so Betsy is a cute little itty bitty 040. The class forty eight is a big honkin' chonkin' O six O. Right. So still no lead truck, still no trail truck, which means that all the weights on the drivers, which is awesome. Uh, and this thing, I mean, you put the saddle tank on it, and and saddle tanks just make anything look beefy. Right. Because yeah, as you were saying, the the boiler and the smoke box and everything is the inner piece. You can see there's a gap between the tank and the actual boiler itself. So the boiler comes all the way back through the cab, and, and it's not actually that whole diameter. That's where your water storage is. Okay, so I'm looking at this right now, right? And, like, first of all, this headlight, this tail light, is, like, very inconvenient. Like, if I was shoveling here, is this literally yeah, the size of platform have, you'd have? Like, you'd have you'd just... not have a great time with that. Yeah, not all of them had the backup light. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Just depended on how they wanted to set it up. Right. But at the end of the day, when you're shoveling you would tend to be over to the one side and you don't actually look where you throw. You take a quick look in the fire, you see what needs to be trussed up, and then you trust your technique to fling the coal in the right but where place. Would they... Again, this would be a coal burner. But this would be like a coal, like just a little basket or something, like to prevent the coal Just from... a cute little basket of coal. You know, it'd probably hold maybe two tons, if that. 
But that's all you'd really need, because this thing was not designed to go over the road. You'd be hanging out around the yard, switching things out, and you would, you know, if you needed more coal, you could go run right okay. over to the coal platform and get more shoveled in. And, like, I'm a pretty skinny guy, so I feel like I could fit through this door. So is there just, like, all, a weight all restriction? Narrow gauge, all narrow gauge doors are awful like this. What, uh, so if you're a larger dude, you're just, that's it? You can't drive the engine? Like, you're just reaching through the door type thing, or what? I, I mean, you can fit through, you can squeeze through them, but they're, they're definitely tight. I'm not, uh, I'm not the smallest individual around, I'm not the biggest individual around, but, uh, yeah, I have trouble getting through the front cab doors on a couple of our engines, because the front doors, if the engine is equipped, which was, this one is not, uh, the front doors are even worse than the back doors. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so sometimes you just do the sideways shimmy through. Uh, and I'm taller than all of the doors, and I'm pretty average. So, yeah, it, uh, narrow gauge engines are small, and that's just kind of how they are. What the? And I'm noticing here, we've got all the, the controls. So, obviously, the uh, engineer would be on this side. we got the brakes, the reverse, the Johnson bar, the reverser, the throttle, all that stuff. The cylinder cocks is this tiny little lever on the floor. Is that accurate, or is that just kind of slapped in here for the sake of... Um, that's actually how a lot of them were set up, just actually. A lever uh, on the, the floor? Yeah, so the funny thing is, on one of our engines, Rear Grand Southern number 20, it actually has that lever still there. That's the old one. And later, they actually did a T-handle very similar to the sander up here. And that's what they chose instead. So a lot of engines started this way, and then they made it more convenient later. I just noticed something super weird. What's that? The middle wheel does not have a flange on it. Oh, it's a blind driver. Is oh, that, God. That's a thing? That is a thing, and actually I've got a video coming out on this uh, probably after this video airs um, talking about blind drivers because RGS-20, the engine I was just mentioning, also has a middle driver that's blind. And that's and just it for a better turning radius? You don't have like... Much three, better turning radius, yeah. Three wheels don't have to... And, and I, it's got double sand pipes as well on both sides of the blind driver. I guess no matter if you're going forward or reverse, you'll get some traction on that middle middle driver. Yeah, middle and then the second one either way. A lot of engines would actually have two different sand controls. Obviously, this is still in the era of manual sand, where you are basically making a uh, powdered sugar shaker work with the manual lever itself. So it wouldn't be a, oh, I turn this on and it works. You'd have to sit there and shake the lever back and forth for it to do its thing. Interesting. But in more modern locomotives, they would get air brakes and they would get air equipment and all that stuff. And you'd have air-powered sanders where there's a little trap that catches the sand and then an air nozzle that forces it down the pipe. So you'd have, you know, a forward sand and a backward sand, which is really important in an engine like this where you're going back and forth pretty frequently through the yard. All right, well, we got to uh, pull onto the switch here and then go pick up the Zuma and bring it through. Because okay. uh, we're going to go back to the iron mine, right? We're going to take the goat, drag everything up to the... I feel like we can do it now. We look like, we I, look I like we're super chunky. Move. This is this is a chunk, and with the two of the engines, I mean, it should do pretty well, I'm hoping. Well, and then so. we can leave this at the uh, the base of the iron mine as the helper engine for now until we get some bigger some bigger trains. I think that's the move. All right, I'm just going to okay, park this up here. Thrown. Yeah, we'll, uh, it should be fine. I mean, you got, we got to just run back and get the Zuma. Oh, okay, we're running back. We're not bringing the locomotive. We'll bring, well, the we'll Zuma bring this one it. up front. We'll keep it in front of the Zuma, right? Like, just have the Zuma. Sure. Sure. All right, so let's see what kind of power... It, it, it is... Hang on. Hang on. Just just the size comparison of I, this yeah, thing versus pretty, the Montezuma. It's, it's pretty chunky, isn't it? It's, uh, it is hilarious. It's still got <laughs> smaller drivers, though, just for the extra torque, I guess. To for give that it, power, right? Just... So the, the, the whole way that tractive effort works and why the wheel size is important in tractive effort calc is that bigger wheels lessen your leverage, right? Because you can only crank on the crank that you've got that the rods are connected to. So any bit you make the wheels bigger past that crank ratio, you're losing your mechanical advantage. But which couldn't is you put the speed, crank, like couldn't you torque. mount the crank further out on a big wheel, which would then give you more of a mechanical advantage anyway? You could, you could, but that is taken up in the stroke of the piston part of the calculation. Because the stroke of the piston is the radius or the diameter of the circle your crank travels. Right. Because your crank sets what the piston stroke really is. Right. But then like, so, so is there some magic number for like a perfect diameter for a drive wheel? Like, is that... You know there I mean? isn't. I mean, it, it all depends on the job that you need done. How fast do you need to go? How much torque do you need? So right. So obviously, if you have the crank, act. if you have the crank closer to the middle, your piston can 
basically, once you get up to speed, have the wheel spinning a lot faster without having your piston move as far. Which, which is very common and ideal for high speed stuff. So you'll see a lot of right. like British locomotives where they're running, you know, 100 miles an hour and running fast passenger trains with light tonnage uh, on, you know, relatively shallow grades compared to this narrow gauge madness. Uh, you'll note that the cranks are really, really shallow in there. And then the rest of them, you know, tend to be a little bit further out. But you don't want to make them too far out because, you know, if you want to have any semblance of top speed, you don't want the piston to be moving too fast, for one thing. But for the other thing, uh, <laughs> the further out it goes, the more up and down the rods do, the more bouncing the steam locomotive wants to do. Right. Which is worse for the track and worse for wear and fatigue and all that stuff. All right, I don't know which... I know I was just loading here, so I know we're going to come in, like, into the loading area. But which way do we which go? Which way is it going to end know. up bringing us? I feel like it's going to bring us straight. It is straight on. So that'll be okay. This thing is actually ridiculously huge, dude. This thing is It, it is so big compared... I mean, Mont it really is a testament to how itty-bitty the Montezuma is. Yeah. That's, re that's the real answer here. Like, the Class 48 is not a big engine. The, the weights in this era of the DNRG is how much they weigh theoretically-ish in thousands of pounds is, is what they vaguely tried to do. So this is 33,000 so pounds is what they... 33,000 pounds is what it says in the menu? Yeah. Okay, well, my my, my history may be off or, or QMA's off. I wouldn't be surprised either way because I'm not the best historian. I'm more of a mechanical engineer that likes the trains. Um <laughs> But definitely significantly chunkier than little Montezuma, and Montezuma's just nothing. I mean, lightest little engine. So was this, half was this air brakes then on the on the class forty eight, or was it still? Like, I think it was. Brakes? It doesn't have an air compressor, so it's still. And there friction are no brakes. there are no brake shoes, so it's not even friction brake. It's just just water. steam brake. Yeah, water it's, or steam. It might have had a water break, but I, I don't know. It just depends. So wait, wait. The okay, water, so the water, water break, break is, is hot water going into the cylinder in the wrong direction. I've learned way too much about water breaks in the last couple episodes. So <laughs> right. I understand that much, but what's a steam break then? How is that different so from a the, water the break? So the steam break is just running the engine backwards. The water break is a more efficient way to do that. And I actually learned a fair bit about water breaks quite recently after I posted that little video about the Pikes Peak engine. Yeah, uh, I watched I watched that. Engine. I watched that. You know what my first thought was? Is that the Pikes Peak where they drift the cars up the mountain? Is that the that, same? It is that Pike Peak. It is. Yeah, it is that's the same sick. mountain. Yeah. That's awesome. So you can ride a train to the top or you can drift a car to the top. On, either on way. A, like 26% grade cog railway. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. And I need to actually get down there and film with my buddy Jimmy who helped present that. But after we posted it, uh, one of my longtime steam mentors who used to be the, uh, the chief mechanical officer for the museum, Jack Campbell, posted a bunch of stuff and was giving me a huge class on water breaks, basically, over the, the comment section, pretty much, which was kind of amazing because he'd worked on the Cumbrace and Toltec in the era when they'd actually had them available to use. So, you know, he added a little bit of extra info that I didn't know. And the, and the primary reason that the water break was important, as opposed to running the engine in reverse or, or anything else like that, was that with the water break? I'm, I'm loaded, by the way. You can you can take them ahead oh, two cars. Oh, oh, that's a throaty boy. Oh, oh yeah. Th that's a that's a big hoot. That's big a, hoot. that's what we wanted to hear. That's that's the stuff. That's that's woofing, yeah. woofing right there. Yeah, give it a one more car. And now a uh, half. And uh, anywhere in there is probably fine. Okay, so if you're running the engine in reverse, the wheels are still spinning forwards, obviously. You're yeah. not going to have the drifting, yeah. you know, moon, like moonwalking nonsense going on. But if you're running the engine in reverse, and you're putting, you're basically putting steam into the wrong side of the chamber, but still at the right sequence, so as the piston is going to compress, you're trying to force it to extend, and as it's going to extend, you're forcing it to compress, like... Exactly, yeah. So, you know, what we would do with the Class 48 would be, you know, haul it over into reverse or opposite the direction you're going and then crack the throttle a little bit. But if you but if you put the Johnson bar in reverse, isn't that like a, a second bar that's adjusted on the wheels themselves? Or is that like, I'm confused how this, because you need to have steam go through the wrong valves, right? Like, isn't that what well, you're- Well, no, it's the same valve. You, you just change the, uh, the, the pivot point of it uh, in the actual motion of the valve gear. The Johnson bar doesn't control different valves. It controls the motion of the one valve you have. 
So it just changes the oh, okay. I see. Yeah, I so I when understand. you're in forwards, you're when you're in forwards, you're working off the same pivot or you're working in direction with the same pivot, but when you go into reverse, you're countering the pivot, which is actually what reverses the motion of right. the actual cranks that, you know, offset things. If you look at these engines, QMA did model, uh, or I think somebody else made uh, these two engines. I think these were made by Glock, actually. And I think QMA may have done this, the Stevenson valve gear, whatever. But if you look in between the wheels, you can actually see there's a bunch of extra rods and bits in there. And that's actually the valve gear in these engines called Stevenson's valve gear. And that's actually what sets up the motion of the valve on top of the piston. And so when you're in forward, the Stevenson valve gear expansion links drop down so all wait, the way. This, which oh, is this link is adjusting the like. valve, which is in this this box up top here. Yeah, the box. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, that so makes all the, sense. So all the guts in there, and the Johnson bar just raises and lowers the banana-shaped pieces. So right. Johnson bar in forward lowers them all the way. Johnson bar in reverse raises them all the way. And so that sets the pivot on either side of the center line of the banana-shaped piece, and that's what gives you forwards versus reverse. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's very confusing to think about, but it, it makes sense. Valve gear is one of the most complicated things, and you stare at it, you stare at it, and then one day it just clicks, and you go, oh, I get this. Okay. Oh, yeah, makes no, it makes sense, because you're basically just controlling the position, and the, so the steam would be this line right here, this little gold. No, that little gold line's actually lubrication. All of the lines are internal. Wait, so they're the inside, like, itself. this front this front assembly yep. piece, basically. This how, whole thing how is called the cylinder saddle, be? and it's all there. Like, how big is the pipe, then, inside that, like, for the steam? It's pretty big. Um, the ports in the valve to admit steam in are probably, on one of these, about 2 inches wide and probably, you know, 12 to 14 inches long. Okay. Or I guess long length is 2 inches, and then the width relative to the engine is that way. I think we're... Uh, do we still have one more to load? Yeah, we do. Okay. Don't worry, I got well, it. Let me know if I need to... It, uh, might here. need a backup unless this wants to cooperate. We'll see. It might load. Montezuma's trying to tug through the Class 48's brake, and it does not want to do it, so. We're good. Okay, cool. Yeah, valve gear is really neat. Um, going it's back crazy. To the water it's crazy to me that someone figured out all this stuff. Came up with this like that that's early, like early understanding 1800s. it is one thing looking at it and being like okay i understand how this would work i understand the kinematics of it you know great it makes sense blah, blah, blah. but like then dimensionally making it work you know and and having it controllable and then putting a hundred thousand pounds of weight on it yep it's then, kind of incredible it's like okay it still works you know like that's that's nuts to me that's just silly all right, so we're heading down. We're going to have to flick a switch here, but we're going to head down to the smelter and then back up to the... Uh... Dude, you are... You are... Yeah. I don't got anything on you, man. That hoot's awesome. Crazy. So the, the big difference between the water break and then just using the steam in reverse, like we were talking about... Steam in reverse doesn't get you the economy of the expansion that using the water brake does. And using the water brake also helps do a better job of limiting the vacuum running into the cylinders. Because if you have... It's a really tricky balance with steam. Where if you don't have enough steam, you're not breaking the vacuum in the cylinder. Because as the cylinder's moving, throttle shut or it's almost shut it does draw a vacuum as it goes, and it's trying to pull the exhaust of the fire into the cylinder. And so if you've got cinders and other bits and nasty things that want to work their way into the piston, that's how you ruin your bore, and that's not a good time. So you always want to make sure you break that vacuum, and later on they figured out that they could make mechanical valves that would do that and just operate via gravity, which was great. But if you wanted to use this the cylinders for braking force, it was a hard balance with steam to give enough steam to make sure that was happening, whereas the water brake was calculated and measured out so that when you opened the water brake itself, it was metering the exact right amount in, and so you wouldn't try to compress water, right, uh, but you water, also wouldn't draw the but, vacuum. But the amount of water going in, let's say it's a constant volume, right, 
as depending on the temperature of that volume it'll expand to a certain amount of steam it's not always going to stay the same volume when it hits the cylinder depending on how hot it is or was it close enough that they didn't care or was it, it was the temperature was close enough and assumed off of working pressure that the big thing that would change it is is speed because you have a certain mass flow that can get through it right right but you're, you're really just trying to give it a head pressure and then allow the rest of the system to expand as the piston moves for how much it's going to do. Because it's only going to stick it in the valve and see what you know, see as much as it can expand. If you saturate the line behind it, who cares? Once it hits that open point, it flashes to steam, and that's that. I'm trying to think of like the volumetric expansion bath, right? As and like, so I'm trying to think of like you have water, hot water in a boiler, and the water is going to expand into steam. And as pressure gets released from the chamber, you're pulling steam out of the chamber. You're losing some, some flow rate Q of steam. But the water, when it expands, increases in volume by a huge amount. So the net pressure should always be the same. And then I guess the only thing you would have to factor in is that there's enough water in the boiler so that it has enough expansion to always overexpand past how much the pipe would draw out of the... Like, you'd never be able to suck a boiler dry. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and you never would, because, I mean, they use Like, the really pressure is always... If the pressure is 120 boiler. PSI, yeah. it'll stay at 120 even when you open the valve full, because it expands in the boiler way faster than you're pulling it out. Is Precisely. That, that, and, that, and it, it's all about that expansion, and you, you got to remember that... I think the number that I, I remember from the back of my head somewhere, and someone in YouTube comment land will tell me that I'm wrong or, or give me a source that I'm forgetting, but I believe the number for expansion is about 1,700 times the volume. From steam to from, water, or from water to from steam. From water to steam, and that may have been for a superheated engine, so that may be like the most modern superpowered steam, so less so in these, but right. still, you're taking, you know, huge order of magnitude change water to steam yeah and if your injectors bringing in like a one inch pipe of water it would take you a 1700 inch pipe give or take well not 70 because the volume is it's pi yeah, yeah, yeah. D, but you know what i mean like it would take you a square uh, cube law 200 man. Square cube yeah ex exactly you know what i'm talking about but like it would be like two three hundred times the size of pipe to suck enough steam out to offset the one inch water pipe like it would be an insane ratio and the the funny thing is even on our little narrow gauge engines uh, 346, the class 70 modernized has inch and a half pipes and 491, the K37 has two inch pipes. The biggest engine we have at the museum has a four inch water delivery line. That's nuts. Cause you know, sometimes you just got to drown an entire boiler in water. So you'd have a four inch <laughs> injector then for that. Like it would have to be a four inch injector line, four that... inch injector line. Yeah. Dude, that would be huge. Yeah, well, I mean, the tender tank holds something like 20,000 gallons, so... Yeah, yeah it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I know that the flow rate on, on the 491, I, we did the most math and analysis with 491, and that's the one that I have the most time with, so that's what I always go back to. I wish I had more math on these little engines that we have in-game, but I just don't. But 491 did something like 2,800 gallons per hour for the flow rate through the 2-inch pipes, through the injectors it has. Right. So it's just kind of... At 120 PSI. At, at 200 PSI in the case of 491, but it's, yeah. <laughs> so it's a 200 PSI boiler. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Although wow. these days we, we run it at 175 because the code changed back in the, the early 19... Or the late 1900s, and that all made right, us so have to change things. Anyway. You have a tender, right? So you're pulling all your water from your tender, right? So your boiler is literally the entire tube of the locomotive, the entire cylinder of your locomotive, right? Yes. And it's jacketed. You know, we talked about that last episode. You know, it's cold, yep. whatever, a couple episodes ago. It doesn't matter. So it's cold. Great. In the case of the saddle tank, like I've got, the saddle the saddle tank on top of the boiler, you have the boiler, yep. which is the center cylinder, and then the saddle tank yep. over top of it with the water. And then the water would just, you'd still have an injector pulling from that, or would you just like gravity feed it in? And then You'd on top, still have an injector because you still have pressure. to overcome boiler pressure. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then you jacket the boiler so the tank around it is cold-ish, like it's. Yes, precisely. So the boiler is still when you take the boiler or the tank off of a saddle tank engine, which is actually what the cog engine was in that video was a saddle tankless saddle tank engine. When you take that off, it you see the bare boiler. But, Are you um, trying to get in here and you can't? Like, I was trying to, here, and gonna, I couldn't get oh, into it. I, oh, I go. figured it out. I wanted to show off the the injector that's very nicely modeled in here, actually. You have a oh, very nice-looking injector on the fireman's side over here with 
uh, the cast oh, that's all what done, this is. done up pretty right. That's what the that's actually the live steam injector. Yeah, there's one on each side. It's okay, very so nicely modeled. Boiler pressure comes in through this snaky line, hits a yep. nozzle. Fresh water comes in from under here. Yep. Gets sucked in. This valve going down goes back into the boiler from below. No, this valve up top goes into the boiler. What's this bottom valve? Then? So the so the top the top one is your steam line. The one that goes forward That's out the cab steam. wall hot steam is your coming out. live steam. Yep. Okay. The forward one that goes through the cab wall goes to the check valve in the boiler, which puts the water in. Okay. Then there's two at the bottom. Yeah. The first one at the bottom is the suction line. With which the valve sucks, on it. With the valve on it. That sucks the water in from the tank. Okay. And then the second one that's closer is the overflow line, which goes out underneath the cab, and it's what allows you to see the flow of water out onto the ground before you can put it in the boiler, because you have to establish the In this the case, it just drains onto a wheel. It. it just drains basically onto the wheel, yeah. You literally drains. right onto the wheel. It shouldn't actually drain onto the wheel. That's uh, that, that that's not how that works. But it should drain onto the track next to us, yeah. Because you have to, to start the injector, you have to get the flow going. You can't pump two-phase flow. So you have to take all the steam and condense it to water before you can get the flow established. So you blow so out you everything open, through the overflow. Yeah. So when you open the injector lever, it's actually designed so that you just pop it into the first position and it starts running out the overflow right away. And if it's not happy, it'll be blowing steam. And then there's some tricks to kind of try and get it to blow, you know, actually change to water and do that. And once you see water out the overflow, you can open it all the way and start putting water in the boiler. I was talking to one of my other engineering buddies the other day and I was explaining to him an injector worked. And I, it, like, it's kind of nice talking to other engineers about it because they understand right away. So I said, listen, you have net 120 PSI. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, so you have a 120 PSI boiler and you have a zero PSI, you know, atmospheric water tank, right? And I want you to inject water from that into the boiler. And he's like, well, you can't do that because it's net pressure. I'm like, oh, but you can. Because you see, if you take the 120 PSI line and then you run it through a nozzle, all of a sudden that jet stream is now at like, you know, 150, 160 PSI. It's over pressure. But then if you run it through a converging nozzle, it goes back to 120 PSI. And then in between those, you're generating a suction in which you just inject fresh water. And he's like, holy cow. And I'm like, this is yep. it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. You end up having it the same pressure but with velocity head as right. well exactly not just the pressure and it's, that's it's what unbelievable how that works it, it feels like it feels wrong when just when you try yeah. to be intuitive you're about not, it but you're when not you look really at fluid, increasing yeah. it to 140 psi you're just it's still 120 psi but it has a, a higher flow rate q which is what allows it to push push through the 120 p it's it's so it it defies what you would think physics should do yeah, intuitively it doesn't make sense right away, but you yeah. study a little fluid mechanics and it goes, okay, that's really, really clever. Yeah, so, it's really smart. I, I love it. It's so brilliant. But to, to answer your earlier question, yes, the, the boiler would be insulated against the tank because, again, we just, we just talked about how you need to have the steam condense back to water, which right. means that if your water tank is hot, you have less of an ability to condense the steam before you can make the flow. So as soon as the water in the tender or your tank gets hot, you're having a bad day. The injector doesn't want to work anymore. So it's really, really common that if your water level gets low or it gets heated up because it's coming through the, the insulation into your tank or whatever, you need to go get some fresh water, make sure it's still working because yeah, you got to condense all the steam first before you can put any in. All right, are you on uh, full reg, full 100%, got fuel, all uh, that stuff? I'm not yet. I've, I've been letting you do everything Oh, I've been so dragging? Far. Okay. Yeah, I would yeah. I would full reg it here soon. Um, I guess we'll just go for it and see what happens. Yeah, I don't know if we'll get eight cars with these two. Well, it'll be close. It'll be close. I didn't do the math on Montezuma, but... I didn't either. I didn't do the be... math on the load either, so, like, we're, you know... We're just going to free ball it. It's At gonna, most, we'll have to happens. double it once. Like, like that's, you know... We did play ourselves by putting all the heavy cars at the front. Kind of, we may, yeah. We, we may need to build a, a quick siding or something, uh, or Dutch drop the and re rebuild it, maybe. I, well, I, I don't think know. we we'll could see. carry the four of them no matter what without the other four. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. okay. Well, we just need to get up to that first flat that. spot, right? And then we'll be good. So. All right. This, uh, this was the bane of our existence last episode, so... I, I can believe in it. It was a time. couple episodes ago. You're forgetting about the one we filmed in between. Oh, that's right. And then there was that's another right. one. 
There is another one. We're so Sorry. far ahead on filming. Don't tell anybody. Oh. Shh, you're ruining Shh. the fourth wall. The illusion. The, the illusion. illusion that we film everything the day of. Right, yeah. Yeah, right when sorry, it releases. a couple episodes ago. Yeah, good job. I, I'm just still in a blur from editing that episode because it ended up being 100 minutes long on my end. Yeah, it was, so. I, I cut it down a lot. It was still a lot of fun, though. It was great to, to see that the number a, of fails that we... Uh, that was ridiculous. <laughs> Dude, we're still we're still good. We're still hauling. We're st we haven't really slowed down at all. No, but we are on the build-up. We're not at the full six and a half We're yet, We're not right? on the full six and a half yet. It comes up here shortly. Yeah. Oh, I, I can feel it. I had so many comments down, of... Though. Yeah, I feel it now. I had so many comments of people being like, you guys should just make it shallower. And I'm like, you should just shut up. You should just... You should <laughs> you just... Do switchbacks or something. And it's like, no, we want to do this a million times because that it makes two and a half percent. All right, oh. give it sand. Oh, I don't have sand still. Oh, yeah, you should have filled up on sand. Uh, we should have filled up with sand. That's fine. I don't know if I have sand. I don't see any sand coming out. Oh, I didn't turn no. sand on. There we go. Now I have, I still don't see any sand coming out. Did it not ship with sand, really? That That's uh, that's a little BS. Okay, well, All we right. made it a lot further. Well, we made it here. Okay, so we got we to gotta tie the four beam car brakes, and then let's just... I think, yeah, yeah. We'll drag her all up. There's uh, there's rules for how many handbrakes you need to tie per certain gradients, and... Uh, I'm assuming this is all of I don't know them. what the rule is on six and a half, but I'm pretty sure it's all of them. <laughs> all of them at 100%. Thank you very much. Just tie all of the brakes. All of the yeah. brakes. All right, tie it all up. All right, I've unpinned us. We Can should we be... start with four cars? Yeah, I Go think we'll be fine with hill. four. Not octuple the hill, just double it. We need a we need a Heisler here is what we need. We need a couple we, we really or need a couple geared, Heislers geared engines, or a climax. Yeah. Alright, I'm moving. I've got I've got traction. You, you've, you've, we've started. It may take us a minute to accelerate, but we've got these are four heavy loads too. These are the heavy cars. So yeah, this literally shipped with no sand, dude. There's no sand in this when I turn on the sand. Wow. Dude. Oh, that's whack. Okay, I'm just now noticing this about the 060. That's really weird. Um the steam dome is in the front on the 060. That's is really that, uncommon. Is that how it was? That's. I think that's how it was. Let me look at a picture. Yeah, that's how it was. My sander the actually doesn't even. Front. It doesn't even work. If I click the sander button, it doesn't stay lit. So I have a feeling either that's glitched or I'm out of sand. Uh, it could be a glitch. We'll have to check. Is but... there a manual sander? There is. Drag down. Open. Yeah open oh it's show i am fully oh, open I, on I, the sand I, I saw sand pop out of your pipe for a second there try that again it says it's fully open I've yeah been... yeah no you've got sand coming out now so maybe the okay UI so if i if work? i it's backwards if i close the valve in the cockpit it opens up the sand interesting okay well that's well either way i mean that's not really how annual sand worked i mean it's literally like you're using a powdered sugar sifter Right, I'd have, to, I'd have to work it back and forth yeah. to get it to actually come out. It's awful. We, we still have manual sand actually on our little gas mechanical that we switch around the shop with. And because it's so light, we have to use it all the time. And it's it's a pain because you're sitting there yanking this thing around while you're trying to take signals and make sure you're going slow. And yeah, it's a pain in the butt. All right, so steam domes at the front. Why was that uncommon that there would be a steam it's dome? Un it's uncommon because usually you'd like to have it about as centered as you could. Um, or if you couldn't have it centered, you'd have it closer to the back so that theoretically, if you're going uphill, you know, you have the least chance of working water really, uh, because you'd have the, the extra height in the boiler where, you know, over the water. Okay. But so, how, how high up, like, so the steam dome is my understanding is it's, it's a way to guarantee that you're only getting steam through the lines that need steam rather than water, right? Because obviously yes. water's not going to flow up above the gravity point of the, the boiler. Well, hatch or whatever. well, when there is a significant demand through the cylinders, yes, it can, which is kind of terrifying, but in most cases you're correct. No. Okay, so how high up is the steam zone, for, like the steam dome from the top of the boiler? Because obviously it's mine goes through the saddle. usually a couple feet, yeah. Right, so mine would be like through the saddle, and then the valve gear would be way up in the steam dome for like... Your, thro your throttle controls the throttle at the be. top of the steam dome, yeah. Right. So the, these engines in this era have these really adornished covers that make everything look super pretty. But at the top flange where the top cover kind of comes up, that's pretty much the height of the top of the dome. Like, it's actually pretty much where modeled in, in the game. That's actually the actual top of the pressure vessel itself. 
Interesting. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I can I can do this. Are you getting three pitches out of that thing? I was trying to do the da 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 da, but it's just not enough. It's not. It doesn't have enough enough range. You usually only get about a half step out of them. Hey, what happens when a train goes by? <laughs> oh man. Well, so we'll, it's good. We'll be able to use this as a helper for now. Leave it parked at the engine shed here, you know? Yeah, I can live with doubling the hill. Octupling the hill was a little ridiculous. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is now, too, if we get a better road engine, then we can probably solo the hill with, like... We're literally using the worst road engine possible. You know what I mean? If we had, like, a Cook yeah. Bogle or a Class 70, like, this would be no problem with the one helper. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm kind of thinking... I'm liking getting to experience the new engines because it's a lot of fun. And getting to talk about the history and appreciate them is really cool. So... Maybe next road engine, maybe we try and look for the Glenbrook. Because I've heard the Glenbrook's really pretty in game. It has a bunch of different liveries. It's cheap, You know, maybe too. that'll it's be the next cheap. one. We could get a cheap engine. It's cheap. And, I mean, it's got less power than the Class 48, but it's, like, double or triple the Montezuma still. So, right. Um, so I have an idea when we get up to the top here, because we're about to get there. Yep. Um, I'm going to disconnect. And... Uh, we can we can swap. It's up to you which you want to do. But one of us can go back down with the goat and grab the other four cars, and the other person can work on like shunting this and unloading it. Oh sure, D uh, dealer's choice. I don't care either way. All right. Well, I've been driving the goat this whole time, so why don't you take the goat and then we're gonna. Oh, this is gonna. Be oh, we're, li we're lined into the we're lined into oh, the, the one track that makes this Perfect. hard. Perfect. Nailed it. Nailed it. 100% didn't okay. derail. Well, I'm gonna. Yeah, just, here, you uh, take the goat. You unhitch there, and then, uh, yeah, go go ahead. And I'll deal with unloading this, because that way I can make the money anyway. Oh, God, Hopefully. this thing accelerates fast. Oh, dude, it, it's a rocket ship. Uh, you're in. A, you're going into a siding. Oh, that's fine. That's I'll go fine. around the bike. Oh, God, and it, st it stops fast, too. Yeah, ah! I mean, you have, you have literally all drivers, nothing else. <laughs> the, the, the math says, oh, yeah, it just means torque, right? Yeah. Just, let's see. Yeah, just full reg, just instant. Oh my god, it's just dude. It's right, it's, a, right it's a beast. Speed. I'm telling you, it's. Are you gonna bonk it? I'm so totally. Oh, just why a, just you stopped dunk. on a dive? Just a little dunk. Just a little dunk. All right, should be clear here. I'm gonna dude. Just... I like this thing. It okay. has way too much power for its own brake, though. Oh yeah, I know it's great though. I think as a helper engine, or a, I think mainly as a yard engine, I'd love to have one of them up here. At the iron mine, just chilling. That'd be awesome. Another one down at the smelter, just chilling. You know, we need uh, probably another one at the coal mine. Although the iron mine one really, we'll have a couple at the helpers potentially. We need a lot of class forty eights, is what I'm what I'm gathering. Uh, they're the awesome early switch engine. The uh, the trivia that it looked like you you looked up some trivia. So trivia for Khan, when did the Rio Grande get rid of their last one? Oh, God, you're asking me for dates, bro? I can't even remember, like, the day my freaking wife was born, let alone when an <laughs> engine was... Or, like, my, you know, I should I should have said even better, I, I do remember her birthday, because it's ten days after mine, so I'm not I'm not that stupid. Well, but you know. The, you uh, our anniversaries, pff, oh, God, I like, guess... She's like, Oof. we went on our first date in 1976, and it was, like, at 4 p.m., and, like, you know, I was, like... Confirmed Khan is 70 years old. Yeah, can't, can't confirm his own, yeah, no, I don't know, I don't know, I have... Ooh, it's, uh, this is getting a little spicy. I'm trying to go down no breaks, and, uh, it's a little dangerous right now. Oh, my God, why do you... I see you, you know, down... The, I just, just saw you for a split second, just hightailing it. Yeah, no idea, no idea. When did the Denver fast. and Rio Grande? I, the extent of my knowledge comes from Heiss, uh, this guy. You might know of him. <laughs> I've, I've heard of him a couple times. I watched some of his videos to learn about trains, and uh, it's been fascinating as a mechanical engineer to you know as to listen to a fellow engineer talk about mechanical stuff. Indeed. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying. Mechanics are always great. We, we um, enjoy these things. The uh, the last one was sold or scrapped by 1903. 1903. So this is very much an early switching engine. They were done with them pretty quick. Okay, so, so what they replaced the them with when they, when they got to, like, other switching engines? What did they start 
What were they, they getting? They didn't really, they really just started using their older 280s for switchers at that point. You know, because in 1903 eras, when we're getting stuff like the class 125 that's been teased. Oh my God, why are these cars rolling away? Their uh -huh. handbrakes are all set. What? Oh, oh, because it's client side render glitch and it just tricked me into wrecking! They weren't, oh they weren't rolling away, is what you're saying. They weren't saying. rolling away. They were there, and then they teleported back, and then I nailed them because I thought I had to chase them. Well, you can just re-rail them. That's fine. That's fine. I only derailed the engine in the first car, I think. So oh, Perfect. This yeah, just re-rail um, I was about to say, they shouldn't be moving. They're full brakes. Like They were full brake. Why did they start rolling away? I don't know. I don't trust physics anymore. <laughs> cool. That so I'm hilarious. doing I'm doing the old uh, pull the car around the load and um, bring the car around the back of the load, and now I'm dragging it backwards, and then I'm going to push it into the unload area, unload it all, and then drag it backwards, and then push it into one of the storage lanes and wait to reassemble the rest of the train. I don't know yeah, how accurate that is, but that's... Sounds I, about right. I understood what you, were, what you, what you meant. Yeah. The, so I'm the literally big... dragging the load backwards from my nose up to, like, back out onto the straight section of track as if I was going down the hill, but then I'm going to push it into the unload lane, unload it all, and then drag it back empty, push it into one of the storage lanes, and then wait for the next load to come up and repeat the process. So you could save yourself a small amount of words by just saying you're running around the train for the first piece? Running around, the, that's what it's called? When running, you, that's what it's called. You're, you're going around the runaround, or you're running around the train, yeah. And that was relatively common thing at shunt yards that are... That's, that's, that it happens all the time everywhere. That is like one of the most common moves in railroading. Yeah. Interesting. We, we end up doing it all the time at the museum. <laughs> it's just, okay, well, we you need guys this have, car on so this end. You guys end have a half blah, blah, mile blah. track. Is it a double track all the way around, single track? It is a single track all the way around. Um, there is a runaround track and a bunch of switches and sidings and display tracks tied off the side of it. So right. there is actually a fair amount of switching that can be done at the museum. And, and a lot of times a when we're turntable by the roundhouse type deal, sing, that's... single turntable, that's the only way to turn stuff around. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting operation that has to go on sometimes when we're changing trains for events or otherwise it's like, okay, well, we now need to put all these cars over here, you know, the winter cars that are enclosed and you need to get out the summer cars and they have to be spun around to run this way or run that way. And it just ends up being a lot of work. And then what you hand tie all the brakes. Oh yeah. Yeah. You have to, if you're going to secure or leave the train at all, you have to secure it properly. So you'll tie down the correct number of hand brakes, which may be all of them just depends on the So modern know. train cars use air brakes, right? My understanding was air brakes increasing the pressure releases the brake. So as you bleed pressure, the brake clamps harder. Is that correct? Or is it the opposite way? Kind of. So train brakes are weird in the way that they operate. A lot of people think that they operate just like a semi truck or a big right. rig where the brakes are sprung on and then you have to use the pressure to remove them. Right, which, which is, is like a safety thing. You lose pressure, the brakes apply. Which is kind of how it works, but there's no springs. So it's all about differential in pressure. So if you want a really, really nerdy look at this, I have Air Brakes 101, which is a video that goes in depth for an hour on this. But the quick version is you have a pipe that runs down the train and it's called the brake pipe. You fill it to a certain pressure, that pipe then fills reservoirs on each car to that pressure. Once the car's reservoirs have charged to that pressure, then any reduction in the brake pipe will then cause the brakes to come on. So if you lose a car, you lose the engine, the train well, what separates. What happens if the reservoir like, just falls off or explodes or something? Then well, then it doesn't work anymore. Well, then you wouldn't have brakes. You wouldn't have brakes. You have to have the reservoir. It has to be filled. Then there's a little, you know, logical comparison valve, so, basically, called a control valve that, that looks at the brake pipe, looks at the reservoir, and says the reservoir has more than the brake pipe. But if you have okay. a car sitting for, like, years in a siding somewhere... It has no brakes. The, unless the reservoir tied will the just bleed down. over time eventually, because valves yep. and stuff isn't... Per and then it just has no brakes anymore. That's why all the cars have handbrakes. So you tie down the handbrakes when you park for the day because, you know, maybe the car will still have air on it in a couple days. Maybe it won't. Depends on how good the seals are. So even modern that's day cars still have an, like a friction handbrake that you could just tie yep. in and that's it? The, the handbrake is a wheel that is geared that then attaches to the brake cylinder from the air brake system. So it just grabs that and applies the brakes as if it were the air brake, but just in a mechanical fashion. 
Wow. And so people always think, no, they're sprung on. No, they're not. When we switch in yards, if you had sprung on brakes, you would never get any of the jobs done we need to get done. Well, the spring you would need have the to cars be insane. to not have the brakes. Like, it would have to be so yeah. powerful just to just be able to apply brakes to a train. I mean, it's oh, a little different with a car. Oh, hi, Con. Oh, hi, Con. Hi. Oh, hi, uh, Con. Hi. You're a little faster than... Well, render, you're dead. Render distance... Render oh. distance in this game sucks. This is actually perfect. <laughs> I can just hitch up now to the back yeah, you of your would, load. Hold on. You you're just... just just you're okay. just you're just out of the uh, way. This is perfect. That's fine. Give me a sec. That's, okay, this is you're, this is next you, level I can't believe how fast you got here. That's insane. You're this so is, quick. This is this is next level switching. Look at that. That was <laughs> that was called like a Dutch dead drop. Drive the man off the cliff drop. <laughs> just this is I don't know what to call This is the most now. advanced railroad move I've ever seen. Dude, that you have no idea. Look at that. That was unbelievable. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. That was, that was hilarious. I'm, on my end, it's just like, okay, put along, put along, talking, and then I'll, you just render, and then well, it's like, I was by the still, time I, I do anything. I was going as fast as I could. I can't believe how fast you got back up here. I was really just trying <laughs> to haul it, but apparently not fast enough. Hey, man, four cars? That, that's the whole point of this alignment and why switchbacks are bad. Like, being able to run up that, that easily is great, and if you've got the power to do it in one go or two goes, I mean, I prefer running this hill twice than to do a single switchback, personally. Right. I can't believe how quick you were. That's amazing. Yeah, dude, it's it's awesome. I, I really like that engine. It, it's pretty faithfully modeled as far as I can tell. There's not terribly many pictures of the Class 48, but the cab looks pretty good. It looks like things are in the right place, and, and it's a fun model, and I had no idea how big it would be in person. An Unreal Engine, you pile of garbage. Oh, did it just crash? Oh, hello. Welcome back. I'm finally back after running across the mountains twice. I don't right. know what it is about my game and liking to crash twice in a row, but it just, uh, yeah, here it's, I am. It's, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, I unloaded the train. <laughs> you, this, this unloads? Yeah, this unloads. This it is the lets you do this? This is actually the furthest. You can s exactly four cars, and you can unload this. Uh, and then it, it bonks right into the, uh, the stopper here, so it's actually perfect. That is... That is pretty perfect. Um, All right. So anyway, we got to reassemble the train. We got to turn the Zuma around. We got to turn the Class Forty Eight around, um, and then go back down. I guess you could take the Class Forty Eight down in reverse. It doesn't really need to be turned around so much. It doesn't make as much of a difference, no. Yeah, we can put it down in reverse and, and put it into the engine shed, um, and then we're gonna bring the Zuma. We got to turn the Zuma around. Is the Class Forty Eight still binned somewhere? Or no, where I, is it? I I I rerailed it. It's it's good. It's back where, on. It's just break up there. Where, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's like, still don't see it. Still don't see it. Oh, hey, there it is. But yeah, if you want to throw some switches so I can pick up the rest of this, and then we got to spin this guy. Um, you sure, can You can sure. spin on the turntable this time, because I'm really tired of having to click and hold that. It's, uh... <laughs> you know, Fair. it's not a fun Fair. experience. It's very, very time-consuming and painful. Well, it, it's worse when you're actually pushing a real turntable with a real locomotive on it by hand. I so, can imagine. You know. How long does it take you to spin 180 degrees on a locomotive? What would you it, say? It, it takes... I mean, the, the speed in game is pretty accurate. Because <laughs> if you were to spin 180 degrees, it's like probably like a minute or so to spin the whole engine, or...? Oh, easily, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's... It's Dunk. a lot of momentum and a lot of rotational inertia to overcome, so... Right. All right, you're lined into the rest of the cars. Perfect. Kick him. How's the hitch situation? Oh, yeah, right, I can kick him. That's right, that's right. Actually, you can kick him. Hop on my cars, bro. Yeah, hang on. I'm getting a pin and link in this one so that we're ready. All right, I'm gonna break a little and then, bit. And uh, then, there you go. Okay, Kick. you're cut off, so you break all the way. Yeah, perfect. And then just throw that switch for me afterwards. Yep. As soon as these guys roll past, I gotta get all the way off that, the switch. Well, this switch is. The yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, because it's gonna silly. reset it. All right. Throw me because, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Then clear now. All right. Thank you're you. Good I will table. go spinny, gonna... spinny. I'm gonna make sure that I can actually hitch these, make sure there's no double link real quick. Then we'll get you spun around. Perfect. Dunk. Love it. Got it. I wouldn't want to do these kind of shunt yards if we didn't have the end stoppers. Um, like, right, yeah, it, it is so much more freeing to just kick stuff knowing that yeah. it's not going to be a problem. Knowing it'll stop eventually and won't just keep going off the track and then you have to, you know, have this whole re-railing nonsense going on. Yep, 
it definitely sure. definitely makes it a lot better but that being said now that we have those it really makes me want to do like more and more industries like this because it's actually it's a different experience having to deal with all this yeah it slows down the progression so i get why people don't like to do it yeah but it's really fun and really i don't know it's really interesting to actually do it that way so well, and, and if you had God, the more people, like once we have more engines, more people, you'll have we'll have people whose entire job is to run an industry. Like you saw that I couldn't even unload those cars before you showed up again with the next load. You know right. what I mean? It's like, the whole thing. Switching out the industry takes time. Sorry, I'm dealing with turntable momentum. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I turntables are amazing. Be, yep, yep, you're there. Perfect. Thank you, sir. And now we go speed. All as right. long as you don't fall off the other end, jeez. I'm good. I wanted to park it right in the middle so that the center of gravity is really, you know, helping you out. You know what I mean? I was... Well, there you go. Just That's thinking fine. of you and balancing this turntable properly. <laughs> we actually, today, uh, getting the 491 out for the Polar Express, because we're still running the Polar Express at the museum here. Uh, <laughs> we had it misspotted by, like, six inches, and it was everything to get that turntable moving today. It was awful. So you'd still try and turn the tr well, you wouldn't just move the we, we could respot it but it's like we thought it was spotted right it's a little hard to tell if it if it just bounced because the momentum and the inertia or if it was actually freely floating and so you think it's spotted and sometimes it's not and then you it's just uh, like, overshot that I, by like, I see I see that there is a handle that. on the other side as well you could go grab well, I'm but I started over here okay that's true life's hard. So when you're doing yeah. this in, in, in real life, it's one one dude pushing it. You have multiple people pushing it. Oh, usually, usually it's about two or three. Right. Um, if if it's if it's four ninety one, I mean four ninety one is one hundred and fifty tons. She's she's a chunk. So usually, yeah, it's a a lot of people. One guy can do it, but it's not very fun. So. Well, that was a little little sketchy bouncing back onto the track there. <laughs> no big deal. It's uh you should, again the real one's worse. The mismatch is just enough. I mean, the sounds the wheels make when they go across the table. It's always a little surprising. How far apart's the gap on it? Like a couple inches, or is it um, I mean, bigger than that? Height-wise, it's maybe, maybe worst case, two inches. Gap-wise, probably an inch, inch and a half. So yeah, it can, it can be pretty gnarly. All right, well, I guess I'll grab the Class 48 if we're not going to bother to spin it. Uh, yeah, well, you got to hitch, hitch me up, sir. I'm gonna take all yeah. the Yeah. Oh no. Okay. We'll put you. We'll put you on as the the lead engine or the road engine, and then yeah. we can just kick the uh, or put the class 48 in the shed facing the right way for the next yeah. helper service. Exactly. Uh, we yeah. We'll take this back to the freight depot. But we'll leave the class 48. The the engine we just saved up to and bought. We're just gonna park in a shed. We're just gonna park it now. Yeah. Yeah. Ran one parked. All ran right, one back. parked it. It'll be good though. Whenever we come back here, we can just keep using it. I mean, I'm hoping we can buy a hopper. And start delivering iron next, even though it'll only be a single hopper. But you know, uh, making money both directions really helps. Yeah, increase the efficiency of the railroad because when you're only making money going one way, it's kind of silly. Well, it, and if we back. get at least one hopper, we can start um, like we can park our hopper at the smelter, and then you know when we come back, take it up with us, take yeah. it up, and all sorts. All right, of pinned stuff. in. Take him a head to the class forty eight. All right, gotta get a break on the back here. I, so I had a lot of people in the comments. They said the reason we derailed is because we were going too fast and the back brakes had like weren't enough to compress and the car was compressing all the way down. I feel like we did it because back brakes are bad. Like tension yeah, in this the, game the, is the not. Yeah, the tension, tension in this game doesn't work for one thing. We right. were going beyond the speed limit of spiciness, which is a thing in this game. That's why most of the engines are capped to about 16 or 17 mile an hour. Yeah. Uh, so it's definitely a little column A, a little column B. But uh, you know, for best results, brake from the head end. You don't have any. You don't have any brakes on, right, at the back? I do this? not. Yep. Okay. They're all. They're all kicked off. Yeah. I'm gonna brake from the engine and the tender and see how that goes, and then go from there. <laughs> All right, you're good. You can uh, head on down. You're gonna have to go past oh, me and okay. then pull into the the ahead because the shed is like um I don't know what it's like a double switch. It's like a switch and a switch. My God, you're so fast. Okay, see ya. Speedy boy. But yeah, the the engine shed there is a switchback, so you're gonna have to like pull in and then get out of the way. And I'm gonna come down slow and try not to bin it. That's sort of the objective today. All right. Well, if uh, anyone's got a peanut cup, it's gonna be gone. I haven't binned it yet today. You've binned it twice. Wait, no, only once. Uh, uh, 
Was it? Yeah, well, only... you binned it when I didn't see, so no, I don't know if that counts. Te technically twice. Yeah. But yeah, the, the first one was the games. Actually, both of them were the games render distance. Oh, uh, yeah. Blaming, blaming the technology, not the operator itself. Sounds very familiar. Naturally. Naturally. It's the thing to do. All right. I'm at full break and full tender break. I am at 0% everything except 100% whistle. Sorry, 81% whistle because I didn't have boiler pressure. <laughs> Turning off my tender break. Yeah, this seems a lot safer if I just go nice and slow. Sort of maintain it. Although, once all the cars get on the hill, that's when it really starts to push. You can feel it. You can feel it in the real thing, too. It's, um, oh, it's I'm kind sure. of amazing. We, we've been running the Polar Express, and we've been alternating between the, the 20 and the 491. And 20 weighs maybe 40 tons all said and done. And 491 weighs 150. But you're pulling what? Three and a half percent? Five, five cars? Five cars on a three and a half percent. And the cars weigh about 40,000 pounds a piece, the passenger cars. So 200,000 pounds of stuff. Yeah, getting pretty close to that, yeah. Plus all the uh, for all the fat people that are getting yeah, on the yeah, train. Yeah, add a, you add 140, yeah. you know. <laughs> 140 herd of uh, humans. Well, uh, this is Colorado. <laughs> are we talking like are we talking like Texas big or are we talking like Colorado big? You know, I, mean, I don't like, Colo Colorado's populous. I hear everything's is bigger in Texas. That's what I've been told, you know. So it's like Colorado's populace is generally relatively fit. Doesn't mean everyone and we're not shaming Now, are we talking here, but, hipster fit uh, or know. like haven't eaten in like 40 days fit or like, you well, know. Well, you know, look like, like lots of outdoorsy type people around here, so they like to, you know, stick with it and all that you know so. it, we joke about this and then like and don't get me wrong we're not we're not trying to body shame anybody like you know do you do whatever makes you happy but um it's a real calculation that airlines have to do yeah and like there's train actual companies worst case, do, and there's mass worst case behind loading it. yeah yeah and, and there's like a worst case same, loading like, calculation that has to be done when when we do brake testing on like the commuter rail stuff that I've been a part of and PTC positive train control testing, they have to do simulated loading conditions for you know having what's the worst case load in each car and we usually end up adding an extra train car to the train with the brakes cut out to simulate the load of the people. So you right. think of a commuter commuter train with seven cars, the answer for how much the people weigh is an entire another car. Right. So I mean you know yeah five cars. You know, five cars worth of people. Yeah, you could that assume train, on an airline, like, you could assume that everyone is going to weigh 300 pounds and calculate that in. Will this plane still fly if every single seat is filled with a 300-pound person? Will that ever and, happen? And no, but it's still... But that's your worst case, That's potentially right? your worst case. Yeah, exactly, and, that, and that's what we do in railroading as well. Um, but for the realistic case of us at the museum, it's like five cars, five cars worth of people. You know, it's pretty heavy for 20 uphill, and it's really, you know... It's heavy for any train downhill, right? Right. But with 491 and 20, 491 weighs so much more that it's insane how the train manhandles 20. The train will shove 20 around, no questions asked. But 491, 491 can sit on the train with her own brake and just park it if she really wants to. So it's kind of incredible. Well, I made it down without dying. Combination of tender brakes and engine brakes as needed. I'm uh, I'm enjoying the shot of the yard goat, or the goat in this case, All right. at the engine shed. In the engine shed. It's it's just a pretty, it's just a beautiful thing. It looks nice. Do we have a smoke jack in here? We do have a smoke jack in here. Let me see if I can park underneath here. Make sure we don't die of black lung or asphyxiation or anything. It's nice. It's a nice looking train, man. It's going to be great. We got a nice little helper station now. I'm nice almost spotted under the smoke jack. Almost. Nice little train parked at the helper station. That's so wonderful. Oh, we could easily fit two class 48s in one lane. And it's centered enough that it works. Yeah, and probably a couple, a couple climaxes or heislers in here as well. This is perfect. We're going to have lots of space. I love it. Well, good night, goat. We'll see you next time we come back.
Yeah, it'll probably be pretty soon. I'm not gonna lie. I feel like we're gonna uh, be back. We, we, we need iron. We need, yeah, we need iron. iron. Hop on board, sir. Let's get out of here. Come on. Let's go. Let's get back to the freight depot and do the do it all again. Do it all again. Man, and welcome to trains. I don't know what to tell you. This is what you do with trains. We, we, we run this way, then we run that way. Congratulations. Then we go back, and then we should probably fill up with sand at some point, but whatever. We definitely need a better road engine. I agree. I think the next engine we yeah. buy it needs to be an upgrade yeah. to the road engine series. Um, even if it's For not sure. an expensive one, it's just got to be another another. I one. love the Zuma, but much like the Rio Grande, yeah. the Zuma got old and sad very early on as yeah. the trains got longer. So. Yeah, it definitely did. But that's fine. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go get some some hot. I don't know how much money do you have. <laughs> Not much. I have two hundred forty-seven dollars. Okay, I have a thousand bucks, so we can buy one hopper. Is we can buy one hopper. All right. Well, hey, that is going to increase our revenue stream because we'll be making money on the way back to the freight depot. So right. Yeah. Well, we I need we to. Start. If we have a hopper, we need to bring it from the iron mine down to the smelter. Um. Yeah. That's a. That's a. It should be fine. We could probably even park the Zuma and use like the porter to do that. And then once we get here, you know the freaking. Porter with one car. <laughs> yeah, and then an 060 to drag her up the hill. You know why not? That's that's what that's what the helpers are for. <laughs> Coming down. I bet she'll need she'll need it. Yeah, we'll be fine. And we just need to be able to afford more hoppers. You know, I feel like that's the the move right now. Is just to like I think if we got up to like four or five hoppers, we'd be golden. You know, maybe even six. It's... Yep. Start making lots of money that way. I think yeah. that's the real move. Yeah hoppers but uh yeah we're just gonna head back to the freight depot so let us know what you guys think in the comments down below this has been an exciting adventure i always love spending three grand on something and then putting it in the woods that's always my favorite thing to do you know <laughs> just i thought it. it was fun sending it down the mountain on accident but you know it's fine well that too yeah but yeah let us know what you guys think in the comments down below make sure you check out heist's channel put the link in the description and uh you know like subscribe we'll see y'all next time bye